Welcome all to this webinar today. I'm Liam Burnett. I'm a partner in Mills and Reeves National Insurance Practice. And whilst our guests are telling today, we'll probably know us best because of our reputation for defending professional negligence claims and also for risk management training and support that we provide to our clients. We also have a very strong corporate and M&A team who work for lots of insurance businesses. And for several years now, I've really enjoyed working with my corporate partner, Paul Johnson, who joins us here today, when we've gone out to talk to insurance businesses about how we can help them to grow and protect their business. So on the back of that, I thought it'd be really, really interesting to invite Paul along here today so that he can talk to us about what happens inside a sales process. Now, whilst we're going to cover the topics that you can hopefully see on your slide on the screen, we're going to do this as part of a Q&A. But before I ask questions of Paul, I just want to cover some usual housekeeping issues and remind you of a couple of things. So first of all, this session is being recorded. And whilst you can see us, we can't see you. Secondly, and lastly, whilst I'll be asking Paul questions during the main session, there should also be some time um, for to have a Q&A at the end. So if you do have any questions when we're in discussion, then please do post them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And you can do so anonymously if you wish. Um, at the end, my colleague and senior legal advisor, Harriet Strevens, will pick those questions up to put to Paul uh, towards the end. And if we run out of time, don't worry, we can follow up separately after the session by email. So now that we've covered that, a really big thanks to Paul for joining us today. Thanks, Liam. Um, thanks, thanks for that introduction. introduction. Just, 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 just a bit, bit of background, background about, about myself. So I'm, I'm a corporate, corporate partner, partner in Mills, Mills Reeve. Reeve. So, so I, I specialise in advising in clients on buying or selling businesses. businesses. Um, and over the last few years, years and, and in fact, a lot of my career, I've advised um, on both sides, sides of insurance, insurance brokers being, being sold or MJAs being sold, sold, but also um, buyers and consolidators who are doing the buying. Um, unusually, with Mills and Reed, we've got this very, very strong insurance, insurance practice that you'll know that Liam and his team advise on claims. claims. But alongside, but alongside that, that, we've got a, a, you know, a very, very strong, strong uh, national and team. team. And, and there's been, been some real benefits, benefits in that over the years, years where Lily and I have worked together, where we've had issues, issues around, around claims or potential issues, issues in a business, business that they're looking, looking to sell, sell uh, which, which is where, where sort of the relationship with Lily and I started. started. Thanks, Paul. That's great. So let's let's kick this off then. So the first question I've got to ask, what are the top three things that someone should be doing to prepare for a sale? Right. right. Um, top, top three, three things, things, in my, my view, would be firstly, firstly um, particularly, particularly with an MGA, MGA uh, make, make sure you've got, got capacity. capacity. And there, there aren't, aren't any issues with your ability, ability to, to go, go out, out and um, sell, sell products. products. We've, We've seen, seen recently, recently businesses that, that haven't been, been in a strong position, position um, it, it really, really affected the sale value, value and, and it's forced them into sales situations, sales situations that they wouldn't, wouldn't have had had they had, they had, had that capacity in place. place. So, so that's, that's probably, probably I appreciate that's, that's more MGAs and brokers, but I think that's, that's a, a, a big, big point, point to, 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 to make, make, particularly in the market where there are issues, issues with capacity. capacity. Secondly, Secondly will, will be the financial performance of your business generally. Ultimately, you'll, you'll be bought on, on and profitable multiple in some, some shape or form. So understanding your own, own profitability, but also understanding where your buyer is likely to improve or increase that profitability. Maybe by increasing commissions, maybe by centralizing costs, um, by cross-selling other products again. Be really on top of your numbers and making sure um, that, that works. Um, I'm, I'm just, just saying, saying there's, there's a bit, a bit of an echo. echo. Um, the third thing, thing I, I was about to pick up the third thing on, on a sale, in my view, and that's due diligence on your business generally. So, when you come into a sale process, the buyer is going to look in every nook and cranny in respect of your business, and that doesn't need to be something you need to be nervous about, but it is something you need to be aware of. And particularly things like making sure your binder signed and up to date, making sure your contractual situation is correctly in place with your customers and your employees, um, making sure that you own the shares in your business if it's a share sale and there aren't options out there or there haven't been buybacks of shares in the past. So that general due diligence piece is probably my third one, Liam. Thanks, Paul. So how long will that process take? 
Um, so, 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 so the, the process falls into two, two parts. The first one is finding your buyer and negotiating your deal. And that can take uh, six months at least, sometimes more than that. That's a process whereby you go out and market your business in general terms to a buyer, get to a position where you're comfortable with a value that's being made for you. And at that point, you then sign up to a heads of terms that sets out the key elements of that deal, primarily price um, and how the process will be run. So that's stage one. Once you get to that stage, you get your lawyers involved to actually negotiate the terms of that deal. And that process, as a rule of thumb, we usually think takes about three months. So the point there is if you are looking to sell, it's not something you can just turn up on a Monday morning, get the process done quickly. It's something you need to be planning reasonably well in advance for. And what can go wrong? What what causes the, the process to fall over? Um, well, the, the main factor that causes deals not to progress is time. So normally, once you've got to heads of terms, stage and you've agreed the key terms of a deal most deals complete however the longer it takes from signing those heads of terms to completing the more likely there is of something happening in your business that creates a concern for the buyer or just as likely something happens in the buyer's business that creates an issue that means they don't want to proceed and, and i've seen this time and time again that the longer a process goes on the more risk there is of something happening or the market changing or the buyer deciding to put that resource somewhere else. So the real lesson is make sure your house is in order when you get into that sale process, because you want to be able to get your due diligence done quickly, your contract negotiated and the business sold. So time's, time's the big one there. Is there anything else? Yeah. Um, well, Time sort of encapsulates the um, you know the, the overall um, risk area. The main the main reasons we see deals fall away. Um, we we've had issues with FCA problems, which have spooked right. buyers. Um, we've had um, key clients being lost during a sale process. Right. Um, and and we've had nervousness from buyers around things like um, the ability of the seller to carry on and run that business. Um, different buyers have different priorities. So private equity buyers will want to make sure that the business has got sufficient growth and, and and additional profitability once they buy it. So they probably the main reason with private equity buyers falling away is loss of confidence in the numbers and the ability of that business to grow once they bought it. Thanks, Paul. And when when you're instructed, when you're in there, how how is the sale process structured if, if there is a structure? Yeah. So I think this is worth um, making sure sellers understand. So a buyer, once they've agreed an overall value for a business, and let's keep the math simple for a lawyer like me, let, 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 let's say we've got a £10 million sale. That value will have been determined uh, as a multiple of profits. So if your business makes two million pounds profit, broadly speaking, and a buyer is willing to pay five times that profit, you'll get to your 10 million pound valuation. However, a buyer is very unlikely to pay that money to you at the point they buy your business. What they will almost always do is they will pay you a proportion of that and then the balance, either 12 months or even 24 months or even longer in some cases. And the rationale for doing that is they're buying a future stream of profits and they need to have confidence that the business they're buying will continue to deliver that level of profitability. So quite often they will structure a deal in that way. Um, and that brings challenges in the fact that you as a seller need to be confident that your business will continue to um, achieve those numbers. And indeed, in most cases, you'll need to have some growth built into that. But it also means that my job is to make sure that you have sufficient control 
as to how that business is operated during that post-completion period to make sure that you hit the numbers. Traditionally, that's referred to as an earn out. Right. And, uh, and, there, and there are a number of um, aspects of that that need to be thought through. Because if you think about it, the challenge is it's that balance between you've sold the business, but you haven't been paid fully for it, whereas the buyer's bought the business and hasn't paid fully for it. So there's a bit of tension between those two. Having said that, um, it's very common to have that type of structure. And, you know, we're very we're very used to making sure that there aren't any surprises post completion to make sure um, you, you, you get the correct value. Probably also just worth pointing out that where that value, say that 10 million pound value is given, it will usually be on what's termed as a cash free and a debt free basis, which means that if you've got debt in the business and the buyer is taking that debt on, that debt will come off that 10 million pounds. But conversely, if you've been accumulating profit in the business and not paying it out to yourself via dividend or in a tax inefficient way, that amount gets added on to the consideration and from tax purposes gets gets treated as capital rather than income. I'm not I'm not I'm not going to go too much into the tax, but that's the key. That's the key thing to realize. Okay. Um, I, I don't worry, I was going to ask any questions of the tax. <laughs> I'm already, <laughs> already confused. Um, and so I, you've mentioned private equity. How, how is the process of selling to, to trade and private equity different if, if, it, if it is? Yes. Um, so most of the most of the buyers out there at the moment will have some form of private equity uh, backing because private equity are very interested in the insurance sector. They see it as a as a very cash generative and relatively safe business. And, and it's interesting talking about going into a recession. Um, often insurance businesses have, have, have continued to be bought during recessions because they are seen as relatively low risk relative to other businesses in that environment. Um, so most of these businesses have a, most of these buyers have a private equity um, backer or some other third party funder. Yeah. As a result, it's not the private equity buyer's money. They're using someone else's money to buy your business. And the main consequence of that is the level of due diligence that they will undertake will be really significant because you, you've effectively got a professional in the middle who doesn't want to be, doesn't want to make mistakes. And that drives a lot more detailed process, both on the financial analysis of the business, but also um, the, the, the legal due diligence. Um, the other th the other main difference with private equity, and I've I've made the point a couple of times on this call, is they are they are driven by growth, so they're unlikely to buy a business if they don't see an ability for them to grow that business. And I mentioned at the start things like an ability to take cost and centralize cost, an ability to get higher margins from the insurance companies, um, an ability to cross sell. Um, so when when you are dealing with a private equity buyer you need to have that front of mind i always think because you need to be confident in your numbers and you need to know that you will have to deliver that sort of growth really for them to be interested the, the big advantage of private equity because they want that growth is quite often they'll incentivize you to achieve that growth and provided your business can meet that criteria you'll get a higher value further down the process. Okay. Um, now, trade buyers slightly different. Um, you know, they will have some of the same, uh, they, they will have some of the same criteria, but often they will be more interested in cross-selling products and more interested in, in, in buying and distribution rather than effectively growing that broken business or that MGA business itself. And with trade buyers, you, you, you can often have a less complex process and they are also more likely to pay a bit more upfront and have less dependent on the performance of the business over a period of time. Um, and 
that's just that's just the reality of the marketplace. Um, people get nervous about private equity, um, and the thing uh, the thing to remember with private equity is broadly, if your business is performing well, there isn't an awful lot to worry about. If your business stops performing, then private equity are going to be a bit more ruthless in most situations than trade, and they you know they may take more drastic steps to make sure that business does carry on performing. Um, the other point to make is is quite often private equity, because they're interested in that growth again, may incentivize a seller by allowing that seller to keep a proportion of the business. And when private equity sell out in the future, the logic be being that the seller gets that gain in the percentage of shares that they've kept in that business or ownership they've kept in the business. Right. Un unlikely to happen with trade because trade is less likely to have that exit in the future. So they aren't as keen on incentivizing sellers alongside that. So that's probably the main differences, Liam, if I've explained that, if I've explained no, that a bit well enough. Yeah, no, really clear. No, and, and thank you very much for your time, Paul. I think that reached the end of the questions that I wanted to ask. Um, it was really insightful. I believe we've got a couple of questions from the audience. So I'm now going to hand over to Harriet to put those to you. It's okay. Thank you. Yeah, that's fine. Yes, we do have a, a couple, if I may, um, Paul. The first question, apart from yourself, of course, if I may say so, who would you recommend to advise a seller to make sure they get the best offer for their business? Yeah, I think that's a really good question, Harriet, in that to get the to, to get the advice to sell your business it costs so there's the specialist advisors out there corporate finance teams who spend a lot of time speaking to the consolidators and the people buying insurance businesses and they also have a lot of expertise around making sure that they understand the financials and they can give you a lot of advice as regards how your business should look financially and which of the consolidators has an appetite for your type of business or whether you might be a strategic buy for them. Um, so I've seen lots of situations over the years where clients have come to me with an offer that they've already had agreed with a buyer. At that point, it's difficult to reopen those negotiations and change that offer. And I, and, and I would say, the majority of circumstances where that happens, they would have been able to get a better offer with an advisor involved. Okay. That, that, that's tricky though, isn't it? Because without knowing where to go for that advice. Yes, no, I agree. But, and, and certainly, you know, we have a very good network of advisors who we know who we would trust to put into that situation. Mm. But most of these advisors will give you some of their time for free if you if they realize you're looking to sell your business. And I think, you know, well-advised business will go and speak to three or four of these advisors, find out which ones they like the sound of, understand their cost base, and 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 that allows them to take a bit of the risk out of um that choice. However, you know, it's 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 one it, 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 you, you're unlikely to do it a number of times in your career and you're unlikely to have much experience of it. So it is something that you need to try and find a trusted advisor who can help you make that decision would be my advice. That, that's um, the million dollar question, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> um, second question that's coming through is, do you think now is the right time to sell? Um, it's an interesting question again. Um, there's talk about a recession coming down the line. Um, however, there is a lot of capital out there still that is looking to invest in this sector. Um, I think the biggest challenge at the moment is there's been a lot of consolidation already. And I suspect if you're sat there with a good quality MGA or good quality broking business, um, then there will almost certainly be appetite out there um, to acquire you. Um, the multiples have been very, very good. Um, and, you know, we've been involved in a couple of sales recently that have gone very well. Um, and sellers have been able to achieve a really, a really good outcome. Um, so I, I, I think the flip side of that is 
a lot depends on where you are with your business, what your motivation is, um, and um, and what you want to achieve. Um, and but but I think you need to be aware that the process of selling a business can take a long time. And when I talked at the start about your financials being ready, you might go to a financial advisor now. And they might look at your business and they might say, well, you know, that's a good business, but um, this is the part of your business that's going to drive most value. Um, what we would advise is you concentrate on that and you grow that and put a bit more effort into that over a period of time. Um, and and that takes time. So, again, it, 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 if, if you're thinking that there's a sale in mind in the future, the best advice is to get speaking to getting your team around you, thinking about what you need to do early on. Um, and the due diligence point you know, comes back to that again. When I said the top three things were sort of your capacity, um, financials and your due diligence, it's exactly the same on due diligence. The longer you give yourself to sort out any problems, the less likely there's going to be a problem when you actually come to sell. And the less likely your sale process is going to drag on and create a problem. Um, so is it, a right to, is, is it the right time to sell? Um, I, you know, a good, a good business, you're always going to be able to sell it. And at the moment, I think there is still a lot of appetite out there for um good well-run businesses so um we when we speak to private equity and we speak to buyers the biggest challenge they've got at the moment is finding those quality businesses to buy it's not uh, it, it, it's not finding a buyer yeah that, that's good to hear obviously a lot of food for thought and i could go on asking you questions all morning but unfortunately we're coming to the end of our session so i'll pass the baton back to liam if i may liam thanks harriet and thanks very much paul so if that's the end of the questions, that, that brings us to a close for today. But please do contact Paul or myself if I if I can offer any assistance um, and we'll we'll do our best after this session to respond by email. Um, otherwise, thank you very much for joining us. And when you do log off, please do complete the feedback form that should show um, on your screen. Um, the next session in, in the box series will be on the 6th of December, where Ben Hardiman and Shara Bagan will be considering the impact for brokers of the three recent High Court uh, judgments on COVID business interruption losses in Stonegate and Amlin, Gregson, Jurek and various eateries versus Allianz. Um, other than that, um, thank you very much for joining us. We hope you can join us for the next session and have a great day.